Isn't, isn't God good how he gave me this morning the last word? Pa- past, pa- past, Pastor Bill uh, got a, had a jab at me, and then he prayed that we would have eyes to hear. <laughs> we're, gonna chip, we're all going to chip in and get you a hearing eye dog. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and uh, I just thank God for the, for the privilege and the opportunity to, just to share a little bit of, of His Word, and, uh, and I pray that the Lord would speak to our hearts and, and give us something that we can take away and help us in our day-to-day lives, starting, starting after we leave here or even while we're here and throughout the week. I'd like to begin this morning by just telling uh, the story that I had heard about this young, enthusiastic evangelical country pastor who got called to his first church and he was all excited and he was going to serve the Lord and, and he no sooner got to the church that uh, two of the elders invited him out on, on, on Monday morning to go, to go fishing in the local lake and he was all excited about that getting to know some of them a couple of the men and uh, so they, they left early on Monday morning and they went out they got the boat and went out to the lake and they just parked a little ways offshore not too far you know 20 or 30 feet and uh, no sooner they got ready to go than one of the elders said I forgot the worms so he said, don't worry about it. So he jumped out of the boat, and he ran right across, and ran on top of the water, and he got the worms, and he came back, and the young pastor was thinking, this church is going to be awesome, the pastor. These people are amazing. And so they started, they started, uh, they started fishing, and fishing was good, and not too long later, the, the, other, uh, the other deacon said, I brought us a cup of coffee, left it in the truck. So he jumps out of the boat, and he skips across, and gets the coffee, and he comes back, and this young pastor, he can't stand it. He's just... This is an amazing, these people are unbelievable. So not too much time went by, and then one of the, one of the elders said, they were, they were getting on in age, they were forgetful, and the, the elders said, I've made us some sandwiches, and, I, and I, I forgot to bring them. And the young pastor said, I'll get them, brothers. And he jumped out of the boat, and down he went right into the water. And the, the elder looked at the other elder and said, didn't you tell them where the rocks were? So I, that, that's kind of an introduction to my, uh, to my text this morning, and it's found in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 31, and I'd just like to read them uh, if I could. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, that's between three and six o'clock in the morning, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, this is the Son of God. I want to take a few minutes this morning, and I want to just take a, take a look at Peter and just talk a little bit about this a story, this, uh, this, this, this message from the Scriptures that we're all quite familiar with. And, and one of the things I noticed that Peter, Peter had, that I probably we have a lot in common with him, Peter had a desire to get closer to God. And I dare say that if I, if I asked how many here have a desire to get closer to Jesus, uh, probably most, uh, most folks would earnestly put their hands up and, and, and would mean it. They would say, yes, Lord, I want to be more like Thee. We sing uh, songs after that effect, and we, and we say things to that effect, and we certainly, I don't know about you, but I, I found myself this morning singing that chorus that I learned a long time ago, 
I was thinking about Brother Bill Loader. Does anybody know that name, Pastor Bill Loader? I was 18 years old. And he said, you need to get a good Bible, Bob. And this was it. It was 60 bucks back in 1974. That was a lot of money. <laughs> so he said, you need to get a good Bible. And then after I got the Bible, he said, you need to cut your hair. <laughs> he did too. And I said on my way in, on my way in, 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 in my Jeep, I said, thank you, Pastor Loder, for this, for this Bible, but I ain't cutting my hair. Denise likes it. <laughs> it's staying. <laughs> so, so, you know, make me more like thee. That's the song. That's the little chorus we used to sing back there in the church in Bathurst. Make me more like thee, Jesus. Make me more like thee. Give me a heart that's filled with love and make me more like thee. So yes, most likely a lot of us have a desire to be like Jesus or to be more like him. And we can also, we can also uh, empathize with Isaiah. When, when, when we read in Isaiah chapter 6, he said, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go with us or for us? And I said, this is Isaiah, he said, here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. So that willingness, that desire to serve the Lord, that's a really great starting point for our thought this morning and for our message this morning and for actually for our Christian lives is that desire to serve the Lord, the desire to become more like Him, the desire to get closer to Him. But I want to just take a look at this, and, and I want us to realize that just because we have the desire and just because we're willing to do something, it doesn't mean that it's going to be an easy road. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be just straightforward. Um, in Isaiah, if we follow that a little bit more, uh, we see where God responds, and God says, well, okay, go tell these people. Be ever hearing, and this is what God said to Isaiah, that go tell the people. He said, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. That's not what I would really expect. <laughs> you know, if I, was, if, I was, uh, if I was that young preacher and getting, feel, feeling a call to the ministry, the one that was fishing, I, I wouldn't really expect to get a call from the Lord that sounded anything like that, <laughs> you know. Uh, we used to have an expression when, when, I, when I was younger, I pastored for a little bit, uh, so I could appreciate the, the, the job that, you're, that our pastor's doing. And uh, people would say, how is it going, brother? And we'd say, just in jest, well, offerings are down, morale is low, and attendance is dropping, but thank God no one else is doing any better, yeah. you know. <laughs> That's, that's a little bit what this sounds like this morning. Like, that's not what, what you would want to have as your, as, your, as your call. No, I want it to be a little bit better than that. Well, it's, it's a bit confusing. Why, why isn't it easier? Why isn't it more straightforward? Well, I, I'm sure that if we skipped ahead to the New Testament and we listened to the words of Jesus, it'd be a lot better. So let's try that. Matthew chapter 13, verse 10 to 17. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given unto you, but not to them. Whosoever has will be given more, and they will have in abundance. Whosoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. You'd almost think that that sounded familiar, didn't you? That sounds a lot like what we just read. Well, let's just, let's just read the next verse. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, otherwise they might see with their ears, hear with... <laughs> <laughs> I put that on you. <laughs> okay, I guess I don't have the last word this morning. Otherwise, they might uh, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets 
and righteous people have longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So the fact of the matter is that God's light does shine on the world, but not everybody sees it. God's light does shine on our hearts, but not all of us understand it. God's Word is preached throughout the nations, but not everyone is willing to hear it. And certainly there are many people sitting in services like this throughout the world this morning and hearing the Word of God, and not, and not everyone that hears it understands it. It doesn't seem to be that straightforward. There seems to be something more to the equation. And we want to talk about that a little bit this morning. In Psalms we read, Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Which is really what Peter was asking. Father, if that be you, bid me to come. Lord, if that is you, I want to be closer to you. Father, if that is you, I want to be with you. Interestingly enough, he doesn't roll out the red carpet. He says, Peter, all right, you want to come? Come, right where you are. Right where you are. Have you ever felt, have you ever thought, have you ever talked to somebody and the sentiment that you expressed or the sentiment that they expressed, I would really love to serve the Lord, but my life is so bad right now, I've got to straighten out a few things and then I'm going to come to church. You ever heard that? Well, that's, that's not going to fly with Jesus. He said, no, I want you to come right now, right where you are, Peter. If you want to come, come on, right now. We're not going to wait till we get to shore. I'm not going to lay out the carpet for you. I'm not going to send you a lifeboat. I want you to come right now. Come on. So wherever you are, whatever circumstance that you're in, whatever the situation is that you find yourself in, if you say, Father, if that's you, Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come, he's going to say, I want you to come right now. Don't try to go and get cleaned up because it's not going to work. Don't try to go and fix yourself up. That hasn't worked yet, has it? Or as Dr. Phil would say, how's that working for you? <laughs> right? If we could fix things up ourselves, we wouldn't need this place. If we could fix things up ourselves, we wouldn't need the Word of God. We wouldn't need the Spirit. We wouldn't need prayer. We wouldn't need those things. But all we, like sheep, have gone astray. And we need to come closer to Him. So just because we have that desire to get closer to God, just because we have the desire to serve God, does not mean that the seas are going to be calm. Sometimes you're going to get a call and the waters are going to be rough. Sometimes the winds are going to be boisterous. Sometimes there's going to be dark clouds. And sometimes it's not going to be very pleasant. But God is still going to say to you, come on, let's go. Let's go right now. Let's not try to get things better. Let's just go with what we have. Let me just take what you have. How much do you have? Five loaves and two fishes? That's fine. Let's go. That's enough. That's all I need. How much do you have? You can't speak as good as your brother? Was that Moses that said that? Yeah, that's fine, Moses. Let's go. Right? What's this? You're the smallest amongst all your brothers? Yeah, the king's armor doesn't fit you? That's fine. Come on, let's go. Wherever you are, whatever your skills, whatever your challenges, whatever your shortcomings, he says, come on, come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will make it better. But you're still going to have to come to me. You're still going to have to jump out of that boat. Now back to our disciples. Jesus told them to cross to the other side. They weren't just doing something on their own. He said, I'm going to go and pray for a while. I want you guys to get in that boat, and I want you to go to the other side. You go ahead. They were working under his, his explicit wishes. He asked them. He told them to do that. Just because he tells you to do something, just because he asks us to do something, does not mean that it's going to be smooth sailing all the way. Because we see how they were caught in a storm. You see, it's not enough just to jump on the boat. Sometimes it's easy getting on the boat. I used to really enjoy working in Halifax, and I, and, and I worked in one of the big towers down there, Purdy's Tower, Tower 2, I think it was. And I was up on the 16th floor, and my office had a window overlooking the harbor, and 
I really enjoyed looking out when I sometimes stood for a coffee break and I'd drink my coffee and I'd look at the harbor. And every now and then you'd see down there, there'd be a Navy ship just up the way a little bit and I could see it quite plain. And there was all kinds of banners on that ship and there'd be a, you know, there'd be a band out there playing and all the, the sailors, the, the seamen that were in their finest uniform and the families were there, they ador- their loving families, and they'd be playing and they would get on that boat and they'd be cheering them. It's easy sometimes to get on the boat. But it's not so easy when you're over on another side of the world and there are no friendly forces around you and you're by yourself and you're depending on your training and it's dark and the enemy wants to do you harm and you're in harm's way. Now it's not so easy. Now it's not so easy when you've got to get off that big ship and go and board another ship because you're enforcing international laws. It's not so easy. It's easy to jump on board. Sometimes it's not so easy. Sometimes it's not so great when you're called to step out. And you're called to step out by yourself. And you're called to step out when you don't quite know in your own strength, how am I going to get from here to where Jesus is? I have never done this before. I don't know where the rocks are. It's easy to jump on board, but not always easy to k- take the call when you get it. Proverbs, though, says, Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So what the Scriptures are telling us And what the story of Peter is telling us is that although things are not easy, if you put the effort in, if you take that step of faith, then you will find something worthwhile. Everything we want, in in this life, we like to have everything instant. I'm in the midst of moving from Stratford to North Wiltshire, Emmyville, you know the difference about getting heat between Stratford and Emmyvale? In Stratford, I get up and go, oh, it's cold. <laughs> in Emmyvale, I get up and go, oh, it's cold. I go to the shed, get some wood, bring it in, get some kindling. I, well, I put it down there and I get some uh, little pieces of birch bark and put the kindling on it and light it up. Sometimes it doesn't work. And then I wait and get the fire going, then put the little sticks on, then bigger sticks on, and later, a little bit later on, it starts to feel warm. Whoop. All this. We kind of like the, don't we? It's easy. We live in a world where we like to have things instantly. Well, the real good stuff doesn't happen like that. It takes a little bit of effort. If you really want the riches that God has for you, it's going to take a little bit of effort. You know, looking for treasure is not easy. When I headed out last October to go up to the Yukon, I stopped in northern Ontario to a trading post kind of a place and I bought some, uh, I bought some gloves and I bought a hat. The gloves that I, that I bought, they matched. They were color-coordinated to my suit. I picked them up because they matched my suit. They had little zippers in to get hot pockets to put in and, 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 and warm your hands up. Do you think that the gold rush miners had those hot pockets when, when they were, went up north? Do you, think, do you think they had that? No, that was really difficult stuff. They were putting their life on the line. They had to sell their, their home, some, some of them. They sold, they quit their jobs, they took their life savings, and they went up north to, a, you know, out facing the wilderness with primitive gear. It was really difficult, because, but they were looking for treasure. They were looking for something that was, uh, that, was, that was just something that would change the rest of their lives. It takes commitment. It takes a challenge sometimes to get something really worthwhile out of this life. I remember one time when I was at a a conference in Halifax, and I was going up to the meeting, and I got on the elevator, and there was a gentleman there. His name is Harlan Purdy. Does anybody know who Harlan Purdy is? Yes, some of you know who he is. And Harlan was in the elevator, and we knew each other, and he had some books under his arm. I might have said, I might have told you this story before, but it's so appropriate for today, I had to repeat it. He had some books under his arm. I said, hey, you're doing some studying this week, are you, Harlan? He said, yeah, I'm working on my Ph.D. I said, your Ph.D.? Wow. When did you get your master's? He said, I don't have my master's. I'm working on my Ph.D. <laughs> I'm working towards it. And I said, oh, okay, yes. Uh, Where would you get your bachelor's? Because we went to the same Bible school and didn't offer a bachelor's degree. He said, well, I don't have my bachelor's yet. I'm working on the, that to get my PhD. I was like, how long have you been studying? He goes, these are my two first courses. 
But you know what? That night, I'm sure that night when me and my friends went out to go downtown, maybe to take in a, a, a special restaurant or go for a walk down in the water slide, he was probably in his room studying. That's why he had the books with him, right? That was a long time ago, and he was working on his first two courses, but he was working on his Ph.D. Today, he's called Dr. Harlan Purdy, and he's president of the Pentecostal Bible College in Malawi, and a pastor. And you may have read his latest book, A Distinct 21st Century Pentecostal Hermeneutic. <laughs> I'm sure we have it next to our bedsides. No, I, and I read a few pages of it. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite scholarly. It's quite, uh, it sounds like he really knows what he's talking about. But he just didn't wake up one morning and was Dr. Harlan Purdy, was he? That took years of dedication to do that. It took a lot of effort and commitment and sacrifice to do that. See, he had a goal. His goal was, I'm working on my Ph.D. And that affected what he did that night. Instead of going out with us to go for a walk downtown, he would have studied. And he would have done that many, many other times. Instead of, I don't know, I was out skiing yesterday. Skiing. That's a polite uh, way of saying trying to keep up to Denise. <laughs> I was out skiing yesterday. And somebody drove by in their really nice skidoo, right? I'm sure Harlan could have taken the money he spent on those books, the money he spent on those courses, and bought a lot of nice toys and then gone on a few trips. But no, he made a commitment. He made a sacrifice. And so today he sees that. And having a, your eye on your goal is really important. Knowing what your goal is is really important. Peter knew what his goal was. He said, Jesus, if that's you, Lord, if that's you, Ask me to come. He knew what his goal was. He knew exactly where he was going. Uh, Paul writes in Hebrews, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, knowing what our goal is is half the battle. You will never be able to jump out of the boat and make it over to where he is standing if you don't have your eyes firmly on him. Because we know that as soon as Peter took his eyes off him and looked at the storm that was all around him, he started to fall into some trouble. We know that. So having your eye on the goal is really important. Looking unto Jesus, and what does it say about Jesus? Is Jesus our example? Yes. Because even with Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, that's exactly what Jesus did. He had a goal. He knew why he was here. That's what brought him through the difficult times. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down now at the right hand of God, at the throne of God. So it tells us that we are to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We are to look upon the goal that we have, just like he looked upon the goal that he had. And just like Jesus looking at his goal, when we look at our own goal, goals and we know where we're supposed to go, it will help us to get there. It will allow us to get to the other side. It will allow us to get through the storm. It will allow us to ignore how tough things might seem right now because we are looking. We are looking at where we're going and we're keeping our eyes on, well, they have an expression, keep your eyes on the prize. One of my very good friends, my closest friend, my oldest friend, Pastor John, you've met Pastor John, and, and, and his father was a great missionary and a pastor. And um, one of the things, when, he's, when his father had a, he always had a great love for gardening and farming. And when Pastor John's father was a young man, he won a plowing championship. And, uh, and, and they were judged for how quickly they could do it. And uh, he had no problem with the, the speed. He was as strong as a bear. But how straight those rows were, because were, it was behind the horse, Right? And his, his rows were as straight as could be. And somebody asked him, he said, how, how can you... He said, I just, look, I just pick, a, pick a spot at the other end and I don't keep my eye off that spot. I never look at the horse. I never look at the, at the row that I'm hoeing. I never look to the side. He says, I look right to where I'm going. And as long as I keep my eye right there, I can go perfectly straight. And that's the key. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It will help us to endure all kinds of things in this world. Have you lived long enough that you had a few things bad happen to you? <laughs> Have you? But you're still here. You're still here. Why is that? Because you never got your eyes off what's really important, right? This passage, somebody said this, 
The, the, the wind and the rain comes and goes, but the sun and the stars are always there. Right? Keep your eye on what's really important. A few years back, 20 years, 30 years now, I remember sitting at a conference, it was a sales conference, and I remember somebody talked about a, about a speech, and they quoted from this speech, and it really spoke to me. And I went and I dug up a copy of that speech, and I, I still have the original copy that I got in my, in my, in my ba basement. It's, it's in a box somewhere. Uh, the convenience of today's modern technology when I was preparing for this, I didn't have to go rooting through the basement. I just went online and I keyed in the name of the talk, and there it came. So, so, I, so, I, so I, I read through it again. And just humor me for just a little. This is not, it's not that long, but this... Even though this was spoken to a sales conference, listen to the words of this, this manager speaking to, to these people. This was given in 1940. Perhaps you have wondered why it is that most successful people seem to do the things that you don't like to do. They don't. And I think this is the most encouraging statement that I've ever offered to my sales team. But if, but if they don't like to do those things then, why do they do them? Because by doing the things they don't like to do, they can accomplish the things they want to accomplish. Successful people are influenced by the desire for pleasing results. Failures are influenced by the desire for pleasing methods and are inclined, here's a key, to be satisfied with such results as can be obtained by doing things they like to do. Why are successful people able to do the things they don't like to do while failures are not? Here's a key. Because successful people have a purpose strong enough to make them form the habit of doing things they don't like to do in order to accomplish the purpose they want to accomplish. Did you get that? They have a purpose strong enough. You know, I'm sure, Rob, Robert, when you go out some of the mornings and the, the bay is not that pleasant, I'm sure it's cold, I'm sure there's wind, I'm sure there's waves, and I'm sure you don't always feel like jumping up out of bed in the morning and going out there, but you have a purpose, don't you? There's a reason why you're doing that. You can see the result of a hard day's work, and so it drives you to do it. You do the things you need to do in order to be able to do that, and you do them with discipline. You do them day in and day out. And then he goes on to say, sometimes even our best producers get into a slump. When a producer gets into a slump, it simply means, look at the insight here, it simply means that he or she has reached a point which, for the time being, the things she doesn't like to do have become more important than her reasons for doing them. And may I pause and suggest to you managers, or if this was at a pastor's conference, to you pastors, that when one of your good producers goes into a slump, the less you talk about their production and the more you talk about their purpose, the sooner you will pull them out of that slump. There's a lot of depth in there. That applies to your physical world. That applies to your job. That applies to your personal life. That applies to your spiritual life. So then the question is, what's your purpose? What's important to you? Pastor's been preaching this, this last few months about uh, the new year and the new, new direction and new things that are happening, and it's pretty obvious to, to get a sense of new when, when you see all the changes that have happened just in the sanctuary alone in the physical realm. And so the idea there is that there's not only uh, the change in the physical realm is not really what's important, it's the change in the spiritual realm that's really important, and that's the change that, 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 that you want. And so some of the changes in the physical realm are designed to facilitate some of the changes that are anticipated and prayed for and looked for and hoped for in the spiritual realm of the people that attend here and people who don't attend here yet. So it's the, it's the change. So, so as he's talking about change, then my question to you 
is what's important to you. And more specifically, as you are standing or as you are sitting in the boat that is your own life, in the boat that is your own circumstance, in the boat that is your own situation, what is your next step? Because the next step is really what's important. God says, I will instruct you, and I will teach you in the way that you shall go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which has no understanding but must be controlled by a bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. So God is telling us, you're not like a horse or an animal where I've got to walk across, take you, and bring you along. No, he says, you're there, I'm here, come on. He's basically saying, you're going to figure this out. You're going to take that first step, and it's going to be a step of faith. You're going to take that first step, and you're not going to necessarily know how it's going to go. You see, the challenge with water is that it always changes. One day it's nice and smooth and just like glass, and the next day it's nice and warm, and another time it's just freezing, another time it's rough. I remember one of my trips when I was in Israel when we stayed. The Sea of Galilee is where this happened. There's another name for the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's, it's Lake Tiberias. And so I had the, uh, had the good experience of staying at a hotel in Tiberias. And the hotel had a lovely, a lovely balcony, and it looked over the Sea of Galilee. It was a beautiful sight. And so I thought, well, I might never be here again. I want to make this, uh, I want to make this memorable for myself. So, so I set my alarm at about 4 o'clock in the morning. Hey, during the fourth watch. And uh, so my alarm rang, and, and, uh, and I just as quickly as I could, without waking anybody, I took to got dressed. It was cold out, and I went out to the balcony, and I got myself a chair, and I went right to the end of the balcony, and I looked out over where I assumed was the Sea of Galilee. Couldn't see anything. It was pitch dark. And I just sat there, and I just sat there, and I just began to quietly pray and, and sing a few hymns that I, that, I, that I knew and just have a devotional time. And, and very slowly, very gradually, all of a sudden, it started to, to get a little bit light. And, and all of a sudden, the sun came across, and it come over the, the hills back in behind me. And when the sun hit the other, the other side, they went to Gennesaret. And when it hit where Gennesaret would have been, the, the whole the hills, because there's no trees there, it's just... It's just rock and dirt and dust, but when the, the, the light hit those hills, they turned into gold. It was just beautiful, and the Sea of Galilee was like a mirror, and I could gradually see people mulling down at the docks, and the cars were pulling up, and, 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 and men or women too, maybe, they were getting out of their cars, and they were walking a little slow and going into the little shacks and coming out and going onto boats, and then gradually the boats would go out. And I watched all of that happened, and then uh, I stayed there until everybody else was awake. Maybe I was out there for four hours, but when those boats went out, it was calm, and it was a beautiful day, and it was just great. You know, when, when Jesus told those fishermen to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, I am sure they didn't leave in the dark. That's not normal, is it? You got no radar, you got no GPS, it might not have been, but it, probably for, for sailors, you don't, you don't head out in the dark. They probably went out during the day, probably, and got caught in that storm, and by 4 o'clock in the morning, they're still out there in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. They're just trying to stay alive. They left on a clear day when it was all great. They left when the, when the boat was just dry and everything was good, and the, maybe there was people there working around. They said goodbye to some folks, and they left. Everything was great. But then they found themselves in a storm, and things completely changed, and it's dark, and they're worried for their life. They're worried for their existence. Have you ever felt that your life is like that sometimes? You know, it didn't, sure didn't seem like this when I started this journey. I thought it was going to be pretty good. We always start things with great expectations, with high hopes, and then we get to go into universities like that. You get there and you meet some new friends, but wait till, wait till a second year comes along. And it's, the newness is wore off, and you've got to work through, and, and, and graduation is still a long ways off. It's easier in the first year. It's easier in the last year. But in the in-between, Right? So sometimes with us in the in-betweens when the storm comes and, 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 and it gets really stormy. It's nice today, but what about tomorrow? Is it going to be stormy? That's what happened to Peter. He got into trouble. Yes, he took that first step. Got out of the boat. That was a big step of faith because he had no idea. I'm sure he never took a course when he went to apostle school in how to walk on the water. I heard somebody once say, well, in Canada we walk on the water all the time, but it is winter, Right? <laughs> 
But, uh, but uh, I'm sure he didn't really know quite how to do that. And it was quite, quite the thing. And one thing about fishermen, I lived in Lockport, Nova Scotia for a little while. And we had fishermen. And I remember one time one, one, one fisherman got up on a Sunday night and he gave a testimony. He had fallen off the boat and it was winter time, and, and, he was, and, and it was dark. It was at night. They were steaming offshore, offshore lobstering, and he, he could just see the light of the boat, but the people in the boat had no idea where he was, so they did their procedure. They took the buoy, and they threw it out with a line, and they steamed, and then they started doing a big circle, and this fisherman, he got up. He was what size you, Mike. He was a big fella, and he got up, and he was tears were streaming down his face. He said, I was praying, and he said, I knew I was going down for the last time, and he said, Jesus, I just pray you'd help me. He says, and I put my hand down, and there was the line. And everybody in that place started crying right then. It was such an emotional time. It was such an emotional time. He said, I was going down. He said, I didn't have much time. And I asked him, I said, you're a fisherman all your life. Why didn't you learn how to swim? He said, I don't want to know how to swim, Pastor. I said, why not? He said, if you know how to swim, you just suffer longer. <laughs> if, if you fall off the boat in the wintertime and you know how to swim, you're just going to suffer longer than, than buddy that didn't learn. It's true, isn't it? Yes, they're not that interested in learning how to swim when you're 10 miles out. <laughs> it's not going to do you much good. Maybe Peter was a typical fisherman. Maybe he didn't know how to swim either. So it really took a lot of faith for him to jump out of that, out of that boat. It took a lot of faith for him to take that first step. You see, the real step, the real big step, is not getting in the boat. The real step is not signing up for all this. This is all great. This is pretty smooth sailing right today, isn't it? Even the chairs are comfortable. That's not, the, that's not the step. Getting in the boat's not the big step. It's stepping out of the boat. That's the big step. It's getting out of your comfort zone when you're feeling miserable, when you're not feeling too healthy, when you feel that the, the world is stacked against you, and getting out of your boat because you see, you see your goal, you see your vision, you see Jesus, you see what he has for you, and you believe it, and you're going to go towards that, and you're going to take that first step. That's what's really a challenge. General Booth said, he's the one that found the Salvation Army, he said, give me a hundred men that will preach, pray, or die at a moment's notice, and I'll change the world. He didn't need a hundred people that could handle things when everything was smooth. He needed somebody to handle things when things got really tough. Taking a step when everything is just great is not such a big deal. But taking a step out of the boat when there's a storm, that's what's tough. That's what will get you some results. So my question to you, really my question to me, and by the way, I'm not talking about taking a step and all of a sudden you're going to be a missionary in Malawi. I'm not talking about that. For maybe, maybe, maybe you are here, and that is going to be your next step. Uh, I'm not talking about anything that might be necessarily life-changing. It might be something very simple. That's your next step. You know, you do one thing, and then all of a sudden God says, okay, there you are right now. Now it's time for you to go to the other rock, right? Then you take another step. And then when you take that step, you take another step. But for you, it might be something no one else will even know about. Somebody else might say, okay, that's fine. It was no big deal. I, I do that all the time. But for you, it was a big step. Whatever your step is, is unique to you. So my question to you is then, are you willing? Are you willing to say, Father, if it's your will, bid me come. Are you willing to step out of the safety of your own life, your own boat, your own circumstances, onto something that's unpredictable? Are you willing to ask what that thing might be? Ask with an open and sincere heart. So as we're in this relatively new year, as we're here, sitting in this really comfortable boat, what's your next step? And are you willing to take it? And are you asking God what that might be? Could you stand with me, please?